Hey guys, it's Mac coming to you live from She Equips headquarters here. I hijacked uh, Stab Ruler's equipment in her room here to talk with you guys a little bit about some, some topics that are coming up a lot with me and Stab Ruler because there's a lot more shooters. A lot of people are getting their licenses now, which is awesome. That's super. People keep asking me, people keep asking Stav, what gun should we buy? What should we get? The overall answer that I always like to give, and I'm going to speak for Stav Ruler on this. I hope she doesn't get mad at me, but I think she feels exactly the same way, is that it is best if you have the opportunity to shoot as many guns as possible and then to choose the gun that fits you in your needs the best. Unfortunately, in the firearms world, sometimes it's not that easy. So there's a lot of places that don't allow you to shoot a gun before you buy it. There's only a few that do. And then there's always places, like in Massachusetts, there's only, you know, you walk into a gun shop, even when things are good and we have guns available, the odds of you getting to shoot everything that's on your list and all the guns that you want to try is hard. So what you kind of end up doing is you, you, you narrow down what you think you might like and you might have shot a gun like a week ago and you're trying to compare what you shot a week ago or two weeks ago to what you're shooting today and you kind of forget. And we end up making a decision based on not necessarily lining up all the guns on the table and shooting them all and saying, I want that one. But we, you know, we research things on the internet and we narrow things down and just do the best we can to get guns. And right now, if you don't have a firearm yet, I, I feel for you that you don't necessarily have a gun that you like yet because the market is so bad right now and so difficult. You're probably going to get your hands on whatever you can. That might be another reason why I'm speaking to you now is if you have to order a gun or you have to kind of search for a gun and you kind of, you know, you're looking for something specific, maybe this will help you out. The gun that I'm going to recommend, and this is for relatively new shooters or new shooters that are just getting into the self-defense community. They're just starting to think about carrying guns on their body. Now, other than the Smith & Wesson Shield, which you should know Stav Rula loves, it, that is a great great concealed carry option. Other than that one, you have a lot of different single stack options. But one gun I want to talk to you about a little bit different today is dropping maybe to a 380 and I want to talk about the Glock 42. So even though the Smith & Wesson Shield is a great, great option, it might not be a great option for everybody and a slightly smaller, slightly lighter and slightly less recoiling gun like the Glock 42 might be a great option for you to try. By the way, every firearm I'm going to show you here today has already been checked and loaded. Now, a lot of people might have just kind of sat back in their chair and said, Mac, what are you talking about Glock 42? That's a 380. All right. Part of the reason I like it for new shooters is it's a 380. So I'm going to talk to you about why I like that Glock 42 and why I think it's one of the absolute best choices for new self-defense shooters that are just starting out. Number one, the Glock is a simple firearm. All you have on the Glock is you have a trigger, you have a magazine release and you have a slide stop. Okay, that's it. There's no safeties, there's no extra buttons, there's no takedown levers. There's takedown tabs in here and we'll talk about that later. But they're not levers. There's not something else on the side of the gun for you to kind of attract your attention. So they're simple. There's not, not as much to worry about. And that's a good thing when starting out because what you really want to focus on is just never putting your finger on the trigger unless you want the gun to go off. Glocks are famous for their safe action system, meaning they generally never go bang unless you pull the trigger. They're a very safe firearm. They survive drop tests of all different magnitudes. And unless you pull the trigger, the gun won't go bang. And that's good. I, don't, I can't think of a Glock that's ever failed any of those tests. So they're real, real solid about that. They don't have a super light trigger and they don't have a super short trigger. Now this might be a not great for you. You might not like that in a few years, but when you're starting out, that longer, heavier trigger that comes on the Glock 42 is a good thing so that there's no mistakes when you're nervous or something like that. New shooters are often nervous, so it's a good thing to kind of settle down. You have to a little bit more deliberate on the trigger pull. That actually comes into play later when we talk about concealment as well. Now that 380 round, it's not as well respected as a nine millimeter or above. And it, it, it's, it's true. Like everybody in the tactical world is indifferent about the 380. Is it a decent self-defense round? It is. It is by almost all standards that you're looking at. Is it a great tactical round? Is it a great law enforcement round? 
Mm, probably not, probably not. You know, and what you're looking at is when they look at rounds and they're looking at different cartridges, the police world, the tactical world, really focus on more prolonged gunfights. You know, like, are you going to have to shoot through doors? Are you going to have to shoot through car doors, car glass, minor barriers, all that stuff? And what you see all the time, if you, and especially if you look at, uh, at Asp, that channel from YouTube, John Korea, he does such a great job. We watch his videos all the time. But when you see a lot, more than often than anything, a lot of civilian gunfights. They're super fast, they're very close range, and oftentimes there's not as many barriers or things to shoot through as you see in the police world or the police shootings. The idea with a self-defense shooter as a citizen or civilian is to kind of get a few rounds off, hopefully you hit the bad guy or hopefully he runs away, but then you also run away and you disengage. Police and military can't do that. They have to win the fight. They have to chase the person down or just eliminate them. So a more powerful round that can do more in that world is probably more important. But in the self-defense world, the, you know, just a couple rounds, you know, and then getting the heck out of there and, and saving yourself and saving your family, the 380 has proven to be a very good round for that. And I've personally been to multiple shootings where 380s were used and they caused a decent amount of damage and it does work. Work. It's not quite as good as a 9mm, but it's certainly a respectable self-defense round. One thing I always kind of put on people that really dump on the 380 is I, I just talk to them about like, you know, old old days. You know, like if you, this, this might drive some of you crazy, I'm going to say this, but Wild Bill Hickok, if you ever heard of him, you probably have heard of him. He carried an 1851 Colt Navy. Now, if you look at the ballistics of an 1851 Colt Navy, even with that six and a half inch barrel, they're going to be not as powerful as a modern 380 of this size. A 380 this size is generally, generally, sometimes smaller barrels can screw things up, but more powerful and ballistically superior to those big revolvers that Wild Bill Hickok used. And he's got a pretty strong reputation for winning gunfights. So ballistically, I think the 380 is fine for a self-defense round. Not a tactical round, not a police or military round, but an individual carrying a 380. I'm okay with it. I actually can't. Yeah, that Glock 42 is mine and I, I carry it. Now, the nice things about the 380 is they absolutely recoil less than 9 millimeters or above calibers. So it's real nice because if you think about like shooting, a lot of people are jumping into the shooting world kind of like both feet, kind of like diving into the deep end to learn how to swim. And that's, that's fine. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But I think about like my life growing up and I was shooting BB guns and pellet guns in kindergarten. So... By the time I was in first grade, I had graduated to 22s, and my entire childhood was spent shooting BB guns, pellet guns, and 22s. I mean, all the time. Two weekends a month, easy, we would be shooting, and we'd be shooting like boxes of ammunition. We had 22 rifles, we had 22 revolvers, we had 22 semi-automatics, and I shot a ton of 22s, BB guns, and pellet guns. So what I was able to do, even though I didn't know it at the time, is I learned how to shoot with extremely low or no recoil and also low or no noise. So there was no flash, there was no noise, there was no recoil. So what I was able to do is teach myself how to just apply the proper mechanics of shooting without a flinch response. I was never worried about that pop in my hands because it just didn't occur. So I was able to hold the sights on target and press the trigger without moving the sights like we all want to do, but I didn't experience any recoil for a long time in my life as far as like generally shooting on a regular. So I was able to harness my skills and it wasn't until, you know, maybe, I mean, I actually started shooting nines and 38s in the first grade, but very rarely. I was shooting 22s a lot. So as I got older and I started getting into shooting 38s and nines and, and 40s and 45s and everything like that, that recoil, I, I, I knew what to do. I knew when I was flinching and I would, you know, kind of, ah, I flinched that one. I knew it. I felt that I immediately identified what I did wrong because I had those years of experience from shooting non-recoil firearms. So that whole trigger control flinch response became very easy to me. And I didn't shoot a ton of rounds low left as a right-handed shooter like a lot of people do because of how I learned. Now a lot of people are learning now and a lot of people love to dive right into the nine millimeter world, which is not necessarily wrong. That is a good caliber. But like someone like Stavrula, she carries a nine millimeter shield. This is actually her firearm. This gun, although it's not a hard recoiling gun, it has a little bit of pop to it. Now Stav had experienced a lot of shooting and she shot with her sisters and she was able to kind of learn trigger control very well over the years and she's kind of a natural too. So she adopted that Smith & Wesson shield very easy, very fast, and that recoil doesn't really bother her. Some people, that recoil would still bother them. So having a slightly less recoiling firearm like this Glock 42 
it will help you learn the skills. And then you might graduate to a nine millimeter later. You might want a little bit more capability out of your bullet. And by the way, James Bond carried a 382. So if you're a movie person, you gotta know that's you know pretty good to go. So the low recoil, I think, is a good thing for learning the mechanics of shooting. Uh, and especially when you start getting into tactical schools or you know concealed carry schools, you know, having that lower recoiling firearm allows you to focus more on the skills and then you don't you know, have to fight that flinch response as much. So it's good. I think it's a good, you know, entry level gun. And like I said, I'm comfortable with the ballistics. Now, it has a single stack magazine. And in my opinion, other than the Smith & Wesson EZ series, the Glock 42 is the easiest magazine that I think I've ever loaded as far as single stack. It is just super, super easy. It's easier, in my opinion, than a lot of 1911s, which are super easy. But single stack magazines are very easy to load. So as a new shooter, loading your own magazines is sometimes difficult. Glocks are famous for having a lot more room in the magazine, meaning if it's a six round magazine, you can almost fit a seventh in there. There's room when you bottom out the magazine. A lot of Smith, what magazines aren't like that. Smith & Wesson is kind of famous, but you, if it's a seven round magazine, you're almost blowing a blood vessel out of your eyeball trying to jam that seventh round in there because they're so compact and so tight. So that Glock has a nicer and easier magazine to load. So that's good. It's easy to clean. Now, a lot of semi-automatics are easy to clean, so it's, it's you know, unless you start getting into like some are slightly difficult firearms. Stavrula had a Ruger uh, LC9 is what she had. That gun was a little bit more of a pain in the butt to clean just because of how it broke down when you had, to take, you had to take apart an actual pin to get the gun up and you had to not lose the pin. The Glocks are easy to clean. They have a reputation. I wouldn't say the Glock has a reputation. Shooters have a reputation of shooting their Glocks while cleaning, and that's because you have to pull the trigger to take a Glock down. So as long as you're super conscious and make sure that your weapon is 100% clear and clean and not, you know, no arounds anywhere near you, you'll have no problem taking apart that gun. It's when people are doing two or three things at once, doing something on their phone and they're cleaning the gun at the same time and then boom, they shoot a round off because you do have to pull the trigger to take down a Glock. I think that new shooters oftentimes are much more careful because they're new to it and they're not confident. It's your more confident shooters that generally have a negligent discharge during cleaning. <laughs> Police officers, people that have been around guns for years occasionally do that because they're just so comfortable they're kind of forgetting the simple steps. New shooters I find are much more careful. Ammunition choices are pretty good on the 380. You should be able to walk into any gun store near you and be able to find 380 when we can have ammunition right now, who the heck knows. But when ammunition is available, the 380 is somewhat a popular round. So you should be able to find your self-defense ammunition and you should be able to find range ammunition pretty easy with a 380. It's no it's much more popular than like if you got a 32 or a 25 or some of those small calibers that are difficult to get if you wanted a small gun. 380 is probably the easiest. Another reason I'm a big fan of the Glock 42 in particular is your aftermarket stuff. You have a ton of options. More than the Glock, the Glock aftermarket world is huge. You can get whatever sights you want, tactical lights that go underneath it, you know. You can get different magazine capacities. They come with a six plus one, but you can get attachments that go on the bottom to make them eight round magazines. You can get 10 round magazines, which this is a pro mag, and I would warn all of you, be careful about buying pro mags because oftentimes they don't work very well, but I was informed of a friend of mine that said, I have a pro mag and it works great and I have never had a problem. So I got this pro mag, it's a 10 round magazine for the Glock 42, and it hasn't given me any trouble. They make 12 round magazines for the Glock 42. For all of you that live in free states, we live in Massachusetts, so it's 10 rounds for us. So you could get a 12 round magazine that makes the gun a little bit better on self-defense. Tons of different holster options, all of it. You know, whatever you wanna do, trigger options, you can do it on a Glock 42. There's a ton of stuff available. So if there's something you're not 100% in love with, you can probably fix it and adjust it to make it work for you. That's a good thing, because a lot of guns, you're kind of stuck with the way things are. You don't like the sights, well, sometimes it might be difficult to get different sights. You know, with, with, with the online world, it's probably easier now, but. There's just no other aftermarket like there is for Glocks. It's just huge. Now, the ease of carrying is huge, all right? So I loaded all, a whole bunch of guns that we have at the house, and we weighed them fully loaded. 
So Stav's gonna be able to superimpose those pictures in there for you, but you're gonna see that the Glock 42 is absolutely the lightest. Fully loaded, without question. It's, it's even when you have the eight round magazine, it's the lightest. Now it still shoots with low recoil, but it's still light. And when you're just entering the concealed carry world and you're just starting to adapt that lifestyle, the lighter the gun, the more comfortable it is on you. And you're kind of like, maybe you're not 100% certain you wanna carry all the time. Well, if something's big and heavy and clunky and hard to conceal, and, and you can feel it on your body bothering you, you're way less likely to carry. So if it's light and it's slim and it carries really good, then you're more likely to have it. And a 380 on your body is way better than a nine millimeter at home. They carry fantastic. You have tons of holster options. They are very narrow guns. They're less than an inch wide. They're relatively short in height, short in length. They're small, but they're still not so small that you can't get a good grip on them. They're, in my opinion, one of the most perfect size pocket guns there is because the Glock 42 is really the only small gun that I can get a good grip on and shoot comfortably. As soon as I go a little bit small in the Glock 42, these hands kind of fall off the gun all over the place and I can't get a good handle on it. So it's just big enough for even large hands to get a good grip and be able to shoot it very, very comfortably. But it is just so easy to carry that gun in any type of holster because it conceals so well and it's so light and that matters a lot to people that are just entering the concealed carry world as far as carrying, so that's good. It has a short reset, and that's something that a lot of people don't think about, but let me kind of explain it to you, okay? People always talk about how reliable a revolver is. You can kind of look at that, and you can say, yes, a revolver is very reliable. If I clamp this in a vise, and I just kept pulling the trigger like with a machine, it's gonna go off like every single time, unless it's the bullet's fault. But the gun is gonna work over and over and over again, and revolvers are super reliable. But anytime you bring a human being into the equation, you get to really see, is a gun really reliable, or is it not that reliable? Because I've had many shooters in my class have all sorts of malfunctions with revolvers and every single one of them is their fault. It's, it's operator error, it's not the gun's fault. But one that I see all the time, remember I've already checked all these, they're all unloaded, okay, we're good to go. When you pull a trigger on a revolver, bang, when you wanna shoot again, you have to release that trigger all the way out and go bang. So it's like this, bang, 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 bang. Now under a rush in a self-defense world, if you're in a rush, you pull the trigger, and you let the gut trigger go out to here, and you pull again, watch, the cylinder won't move. And now I've let it out one click, and I'm squeezing this as hard as I possibly can, and it is not firing. So now I'm like, oh my God, my gun's broken, I can't shoot it. I release the trigger a little more, now I can shoot it again. And you can see that cylinder moving. But if I don't release the trigger all the way, it doesn't move the cylinder until I get to first lock, and then I can't move it at all. It locks it up and I gotta release. So listen again. There it is, it's locked. I am squeezing as hard as I can and it is not moving. I release it again and then it shoots. Under stress, people don't release the trigger enough and then try to shoot again because someone's trying to kill them. They're in a pretty good rush. So the revolver becomes unreliable in a lot of human beings' hands. And that's not good. That's not good at all. What you have on the Glock is you have this nice reset. You pull the trigger, bang, the gun goes off, right? Look at how much movement my finger has. Right there. Now that one click, I'm good to go. I shoot again. I'm gonna switch it this way so you can see. Watch the reset and move my hands out of the way so you can just see the pad of my finger on it. Right there. Now I shoot again. Watch again. Right there. And I can shoot again. You're in a super rush, someone's trying to kill you, and you're pulling that trigger, and you're just releasing a little bit, and your gun's still gonna go bang. And that's a good thing. So, you know, this could be unreliable. This could actually be more reliable, depending on how much practice you have in trigger control and shooting really, really fast. So it's it's actually good. That The, the shorter the reset, in my opinion, generally, the more reliable the gun is under stress until you get so short that you're making the gun go off by mistake and you're kind of you know firing two or three rounds when you only want to fire one. But I think the Glock reset on the 42, you see it's got a slightly heavier trigger pull than any of my other Glocks. And again, I think that's kind of a good thing given their size. There's a lot of reasons why you might want to look at the Glock 42. It's definitely got the smallest footprint. It's going to be easier to conceal. It's got no, nice and low recoil. You can compare it to the 380 EZ, you can compare it to the 9mm EZ by Smith & Wesson, which also have nice and easier 
easier controls. But I tell you what, just the other day I had my nine year old lock that slide to the rail on the Glock 42. So he can lock a slide on a Glock 42, no problem, with no magazine in it, just pushing up on the slide stop, and he's nine. So with a little bit of practice, I guarantee everyone that's watching this video can lock that slide to the rear. The Glock 42 has a less powerful spring because it's a 380. Again, another good thing. So it's a little easier to work with. I believe it's a much softer shooting gun than the EZ series because the springs are a little tighter, so they absorb the recoil better, and just Glocks in general have a super low bore axis, meaning the middle of the barrel where the bullet comes out is relatively low to the back of my hand, so like an EZ might be higher. Now I'm, I'm screwing that up just to deliberately show you, but the lower that relationship, generally the less muzzle flip you have, so they, they're pretty good about that and uh, they're lightweight and it's just something you might want to look at. I'm a fan of the Glock 42. When people press me and say, well, I need a new gun, what should I get? And they're new shooters and they absolutely want to carry that gun, I tell them to look at the Glock 42. So good luck with all your decisions. You know, hopefully you guys can find some guns that you like if you can get one, but uh, next time you're at the gun range, shoot a Glock 42. Take, take it for a test drive and see what you think. Thanks everyone. I'm gonna give you the Stavrula high five. See you later, bye.